Hello students. I hope you had a really good time in the any set. I don't know about the all other subjects, but uh, when I looked at the author questions, I found them more well, most of them were easy, straightforward, except one or two. So let me straight away go ahead with the, the questions. This is the first question which we got. Now, this is a controversial question. I, I can tell you because um, this is not a very straightforward question. Okay, a 60-year-old male presents with a generalized bone pain, easy fatigue. So you start getting the clues right from the beginning. X-ray shows widespread osteoporosis and his serum calcium is elevated. Which investigation would be most appropriate for confirming the diagnosis? Now, in a 60-year-old male, what happens? I mean, what are the conditions which can cause generalized bone pain? Now, if I, you know, if I'm an orthopedic surgeon, the first thing which comes to my mind, what, what causes a generalized bone pain in this age group? The first thing which comes to my mind is always multiple myeloma. Always multiple myeloma. Now, does this fit with multiple myeloma? Are the conditions also which can cause generalized bone pain uh, is the primary hyperparathyroidism, which can lead to the hypercalcemia because this particular question also shows serum uh, calcium is elevated, that is hypercalcemia. X-ray also shows widespread osteoporosis. Now, there are two possibilities in this particular scenario. One is multiple myeloma. Second is primary, that is primary hyperparathyroidism. These are the two major possibilities. Now, which one seems to be most appropriate? Now, both conditions lead to generalized bone pain, especially the, you know, the, the multiple myeloma, the bone pain is a very characteristic situation. Fatigue per se is more, you know, goes more in favor of multiple myeloma because if it was a primary hyperparathyroidism, actually the clues should have been bones, moans, groans and stones. Now here we have bone pain, which is, yes, it is seen in the hyperparathyroidism, but it is more common in generalized in the in multiple myeloma. Fatigue per se is more of a sign of something, you know, is more sinister going on because in multiple myeloma, there's usually, you know, the deficiency, the, the, there can be anemia and because of the bone marrow infiltration. So I would still consider multiple myeloma at that point more. Now, X-ray shows widespread osteoporosis. Now, widespread osteoporosis is seen in both in hyperparathyroidism as well as in the multiple myeloma. So here it is almost like a tie. Yes, in multiple myeloma, probably the clue could have been more lytic areas, you know, punct punctate lytic areas. Serum calcium is elevated in both conditions. Definitely, you know, in there's no cutoff value that this is more, when this is more, you get, uh, it's more in the multiple myeloma or high primary hyperparathyroidism. So at this point, when we discuss this question for many more of my colleagues, everyone said that this particular question has more favoritism for multiple myeloma rather than the primary hyperparathyroidism. Because in primary, yes, that's what I said in the right in the beginning. This one particular question, there is no straightforward answer. But if I have to take what I would take, I would take the point number B, that is bone marrow biopsy. Because CT scan is of no relevance in both the conditions. MRI per se is also of no relevance. The, the tie is between the bone marrow biopsy or system EB. Now, system EB scan is definitely for the primary hyperparathyroidism and bone marrow biopsy for the multiple myeloma. Now here, I don't find many clues for the, you know, the, the so-called primary hyperparathyroidism, which should have been bones, moans, groans, and stones. Here it is a simple generalized bone pain, easy fatigue, and that's what is the standard teaching in orthopedics that anybody, elderly female especially, followed by elderly male, if they come to you with a generalized bone pain, they have got fatigability, there is an osteoporosis and serum calcium is elevated. First thing is rule out multiple myeloma. Followed by if that comes negative, then you go ahead and think about other causes like primary hyperparathyroidism. And I'm sure that many of you will find a little controversial answer. Some teachers may give it 
as a system EB scan, but I think this question is debatable. So let's move on to the second one. This is a very, very simple, straightforward, directly coming from the basics of orthopedics, match the following. Now, equinus, planus, cavus, and calcaneus. Now, what is equinus? We all know equinus is basically plantar flexion at the ankle joint. Okay. So, foot in plantar flexion actually it should have been ankle, but that's okay. So, equinus is foot in plantar flexion. Opposite, the opposite of equinus is calcaneus. So, calcaneus is foot in dorsiflexion. Now, planus and cavus are exactly opposite. What is planus? That is pes planus. Pes planus is when the medial longitudinal arch is flat. Okay. So, B is 2 here. And cavus is when there is a exaggeration of the same arch. Okay. So, that becomes this. So, this is a very standard, straightforward question. There is nothing much to debate and discuss here. Let's move on to the next question. Very nice, very interesting question. A 13-year-old boy presents with a waxing and waning pain and swelling in the mid-shaft of the humerus. So as we all saw the MCQs or the clinical clues, the each and every word and line can give you the clue. So 13-year-old boy, first clue, pain and swelling in the mid-shaft of humerus, that is diaphysis. 13 year old boy and a short duration of three weeks. So there's no history of trauma. It means the traumatology is ruled out. X-ray reveals a periosteal reaction. Now periosteal reaction means that there is some activity going on which could be infective or inflammatory or let's say a tumorous condition. Okay. Now what is the next best diagnostic step? It does not say uh, the key diagnostic step, or it just says what is the next big di diagnostic step. So in a 13-year-old boy in diaphysis, without a history of trauma, without anything else, the first thing which comes to our mind is always a tumor and that two evings, sarcoma. Because we all know if it is epiphysis, epiphysal lesion or epiphysal swelling, it is usually the giant cell tumor or a chondroblastoma. If it is metaphysis, it is usually the osteosarcoma. If it is diaphysis, it is usually the evings. Now, somebody can say, why not infection? Usually, because there is no history of trauma, so I would consider it as a, some kind of hematogen. Even if we consider osteomyelitis, hematogenous osteomyelitis is far more common in the metaphysis rather than actually the diaphysis. So, there is more features towards going towards the evings sarcoma. Okay. So, what is the next best step? Now, CT, CT per se is not a good investigation for bone marrow or a bone. Okay. Blood investigation, yes, blood investigation will give you some clue. Let's say you do the ESR, CRP, it may be high, ALP may be high, but it will not give you much of the involvement of the marrow. Biopsy becomes the diagnostic. So, if the question is which is the key diagnostic step or the best diagnostic, uh, uh, this thing. Next best diagnostic is, I personally feel it is the MRI because there is a rule that if you want to do the biopsy, you can, you finish all other basic investigation. So the MRI will help you, let you know that what's going on in the diaphysis, how much is the bone destroyed, how much is the marrow edema, is there any skip lesion, is there any periosteal reaction, etc, etc. Followed by this, you can, you know, the answer could be biopsy. But for this particular question, I personally feel that the MRI remains the next best diagnostic step. It is not the key diagnostic step, but it is the next best. So for this, the for me, the answer remains the MRI, that is the A. The next question, again, it is a very, very standard, simple, straightforward question. A seven-year-old boy presents in the emergency with the history of fall on outstretched hand. So the first key comes foosh. What are the injuries with the foosh? X-ray shows an extension type of supracornular fracture of the humerus. The next key, because there are certain injuries, deformities, nerve injuries, 
they are more common with the supracondylar compared to the flexion type. I mean, extension type of supracondylar compared to the extension type. On examination, he is unable to make an OK sign. Now, we all know, OK sign is a standard sign. OK means like an O. What you must remember, I mean, beyond this, that this is not OK. The tip to tip must match. So there should be a flexion possible at the, you know, the flexure pollicis longus and the flexion at the DIP must be possible. And that can happen only when the median nerve is intact. In fact, this is one of the very first thing we check. If you want to check whether the median nerve is intact on top, means the high median nerve injury. Okay. Because these two muscles are supplied quite high up. So if the patient can make an okay sign, it means that the median nerve is intact on top. So this is very simple, straightforward. The As we all know, extension type of supracondylar humerus usually leads to, most commonly leads to median nerve injury, especially the anterior introsseous nerve branch of it. Okay. So this is a straightforward question. Alunar nerve is usually seen in, alunar nerve is seen in the flexion type. When you have a flexion type of injury, then it is usually the ulna nerve. Brachial artery has nothing to do with the OK sign. OK sign is a purely a neurological sign. Now, radial nerve again has nothing to do with the OK sign. It can also be paralyzed in, the, in, the, in these injuries, but it is not related to the OK sign. Let's go to the next one. A patient with the rheumatoid arthritis presents with the deformity shown. Again, it's a very standard, simple MBBS level question. Doesn't really qualify for the INISET level. What is the correct name of deformity? Let's start one by one. Now, if I just look straight away at the deformity, there is a flexion at the PIP. PIP is flexed and DIP is extended. Okay, so this is a classic this way of deformity here, as you can see, okay, there's a flexion at the PIP and this one. So this is known as a Batonier deformity. The reverse of this is, the reverse of this is a swan neck deformity where there's a flexion at the DIP and extension at the PIP. That's the swan neck. So this is not swan neck. Swan neck, the reverse of this, this is Batonier. The deformity actually happened in the thumb. This is usually seen in the thumb. And piano key sign is a sign of the DRUJ instability. Okay, that's a dynamic sign. It is little to show in a picture, but that you should remember. Piano key sign is for the disradial joint instability. Okay, it can be seen. I mean, in the rheumatoid arthritis, but it's a sign which is elicited. We move on to the next. So the rheumatoid deformities in the hand are extremely important ones. All the students must know all the deformities. We move on to the next question. A 30 year old male presented with a history of fall. He complains of severe shoulder pain and able to move his arm. Fair enough. On examination, the doctor notices his arm is slightly abducted and externally rotated. The key is here. Externally rotated. And X provided what is the most likely diagnosis. Now, if you look at the X ray, very clear. This is the glenoid fossa. This head of humerus, the head of the humerus is out of the glenoid. So one thing is very clear that it is a dislocated shoulder. There are four options, fracture, clavicle, proximal humerus fracture, anti dislocation, posterior dislocation. Now clavicle is here, which is absolutely intact. So it is not the fracture clavicle. The proximal humerus, that is the head, the greater tuberosity, somewhere it will be the lesser tuberosity, the neck, the shaft, they all are absolutely fine. There are no fracture lines seen here. So it is not this. Now comes the question of anterior dislocation or posterior dislocation. Now if you ask me strictly, that's if you have to really assess whether it is an anterior dislocation or posterior dislocation, you need to have one more view that is axillary view. So in axillary view, you will have the glenoid like this. And then if this is posterior, this is anterior, here the head is either here or here. That will actually tell you. But, but the key is here, externally rotated. Anterior dislocated shoulders always present with external rotation deformity, whereas posterior dislocated shoulder present with the internal rotation deformity. 
Okay, and that is why when the shoulder is externally rotated, when the shoulder is externally rotated, they, they are unable to touch the opposite shoulder, which is known as a Duga sign. Once you reduce it, it becomes very easy for them to touch the opposite shoulder. Okay, whereas another important thing is, um, other important thing is if you look at the the whole thing here in a in a posteriorly dislocated shoulder in a posteriorly dislocated shoulder actually the glenoid will be here and head of humerus is somewhere slightly away giving you the light bulb sign okay so normally if you see a normal shoulder x-ray it gives like a Venn diagram like a feel you know this is the glenoid and that's how the shoulder is normally Okay, whereas in the posterior dislocation, that Venn diagram is kind of separated. They, they look two different entities. Okay, whereas an anterior dislocated, it comes and pro inferiorly. So I've just given you far more larger explanation, but that if you have to solve this MCQ in probably five seconds, you know, it's abducted, externally rotated. Okay, next you look at the X-ray, you know that the humerus head is out of the, out of the glenoid fossa. It straight away becomes a dislocated one. Which dislocation, anterior posture, it goes with the deformity. So the most likely diagnosis here is the anterior dislocation. So with this, we finish the basic questions which have been asked in the INISET. I'm sure that this explanation would have been useful for you. And um, best wishes for you for the next examination. Thank you.